Hello, um, I'm going to have a look now at intoxication as part of the mental capacity defences. So it's part of that because essentially what the defendant is trying to argue is that they shouldn't be convicted of a crime because they um, in some way potentially lacked the mens rea to commit the crime because they were intoxicated. So um, remember intoxication covers um, alcohol, um, drugs, illegal drugs, but also, of course, it would include prescription medication as well. So don't just get um, bogged down with being illegal drugs. It can, of course, be drink and um, sort of legal medication. So a couple of things that you need to look at if you are looking at this for a problem scenario. And the first thing is to really decide whether you believe the person um, was in that intoxicated state voluntarily or involuntarily. So voluntarily is where a person opted to get into that state. So for example, that person chooses to get drunk, chooses to take drugs, um, chooses to, to sort of take um, some medication. Probably what's a bit more complicated is where that person didn't choose to get into that state. And I've just put a couple of examples that you might sort of see in a scenario. So um, a person's uh, food or drink is spiked, for example, they're, they're given drugs without their knowledge, or perhaps there are um, side effects to medication that they don't expect to get into that sort of intoxicated state. So they're not expecting by taking that medication to go into this sort of um, automatic state where they can't think and really um, control or choose what they're doing. So that's really important because the rules differ depending on, on why they're in that state in the first place. So if a person has voluntarily put themselves into their position, then the, the courts have got to be quite cautious here. So for public policy reasons, what we want to do is send out a strong message of deterrent that a person uh, won't be able to just take drugs, get drunk and get away with committing crimes. And um, reportedly intoxication is a big factor in um, approximately 60% of crimes that the defendant is intoxicated. So this, this is something that's really, really important to understand. So if a person got into that state voluntarily, the first th key thing that you need to look at in the scenario is what sort of crime is this person being charged with? Um, or, or what could they be charged with? So we have a difference between specific intent crimes and basic intent crimes. So your specific intent crimes are those that can only be committed with intent only. So for example, section 18, grievous bodily harm, you must have intent to cause serious harm. There is no recklessness, intent only. Basic intent crimes are those that allow intent or recklessness. So assault, battery, section 47, section 20, they all do. So they're all basic intent crimes. So if the person is um, being charged with a specific intent crime, then we just ask a very simple question. Do you think that despite being drunk, despite being on drugs, that person formed the mens rea? Did they form intent? So did they still decide, yes, I intend to kill or yes, I intend to cause serious harm? If the answer is yes, then they will still be guilty. The case of Attorney General of Northern Ireland versus Gallagher told us that a drunk intent is still intent. And what they do is they're trying to discourage something referred to as Dutch courage, where a person basically decides they want to commit a crime. I want to kill someone. They get drunk to give themselves the courage to actually go through with it. And then they do it. So the key question is, do you think that person still wanted to commit that crime? If they didn't, form intention so that person is for example so blackout drunk that they, were, they had no way of thinking let alone intending to do something then they won't have the mens rea they're unable to have the mens rea so they won't be guilty and we saw that in the case of dpp versus beard now that doesn't stop them from being charged with a basic intent crime so for example if someone kills and they were so so drunk that we don't think they actually intended that then you would be more likely to charge them with a basic intent crime such as manslaughter if it's a basic intent crime we've seen this rule with self-induced automatism it works in a similar way the key thing that you have to decide is do you think the defendant realized the risk and then got intoxicated anyway and generally 
yes, because they've chosen to get that drunk or to take those drugs. So the court says, if that's the case, then you're reckless in committing the crime also, because if you um, get intoxicated, you must realise there's a risk that you are so drunk that you're not going to think clearly, that you're not going to think straight. Then you recognise the risk that when you're in that state, you might do something that you're not supposed to do. So the court says you are reckless. And again, that's a policy decision. We're trying to discourage people from getting into that state where they're so drunk that they don't know what they're doing or, or they're taking drugs and they're in these states um, where they don't understand what's going on. So DPP versus Majewski has made it really clear that instead they would be charged with a basic intent crime instead. So we're not saying that a person gets away scot-free. What we're saying is they wouldn't be guilty of a specific intent crime. So the prosecution will probably just go for something with a more basic intent. So um, instead of section 18 GBH, we'd go for section 20. Instead of murder, we'd go for manslaughter, for example. However, if the person didn't realise the risk that they would get intoxicated, then they can't be reckless. So for example, this happened in the case of Harris. Um, so he'd, he'd been a heavy drinker, he'd, he'd sort of stopped. Um, he, he wasn't reckless, he didn't realise the risk because he, he had a mental disorder that prevented him from having that, which was caused by his intoxication. Um, the, a, another case as well that we've seen in the previous topic, Hardy would count here. So he voluntarily took the drugs, but he didn't realise that they would affect him in that way. So he wouldn't be guilty of a crime. He's not reckless. Um, if a person is in that state involuntarily, so for example, if they were spiked, then it would depend if they still actually managed to form the mens rea. So we're, we're kind of almost back here again. Do you think that despite the their being in that state, was it something that they truly intended to do? And if it was, then they're still guilty of the crime because they wanted to commit the crime. They should have stopped. They should have decided not to. And, and that's even if their resistance was lowered. And, and this was seen in the case of Kingston. So even though normally he wouldn't commit the crime because he, he was resistant to his um, paedophilic urges, in this case, because he was spiked, his resistance was lowered, but he still intended to do what he did. He still wanted that, even though he normally would have controlled himself. So because he still wanted that, he was guilty. Now, if they um, didn't have the mens rea, then we're sort of back up here. So um, they don't have mens rea and they weren't reckless getting into that state because it's involuntary. They didn't realise the risk and do it anyway. So for example, if someone spikes your, your drink, you're not being reckless because you don't realise there's a risk of anything because you, you don't understand that you're being spiked. So you could be not guilty in this scenario. So basically you were in that state, you didn't realise you could get that way and that's because it's involuntary. You didn't opt, you didn't choose to be in this state. So just the last little bit where people might argue um, that um, they shouldn't be guilty because they were intoxicated is where they're arguing that they made a mistake and they wouldn't have made that mistake if they were sober. They made a mistake and that led to them committing the crime. Well, it's going to depend on what they were mistaken about. So does it mean that they didn't actually have the mens rea? So if they made a mistake, which meant that they couldn't intend the crime, if it's specific intent, they're going to be not guilty. However, remember the rule, if you get yourself into this state, then you're still reckless. And a really good case example to understand this is Lippmann, where um, he, he'd taken LSD and he thought he was killing snakes. He thought he was attacking snakes in the centre of the earth while he was having a trip um, on, his, on the LSD. Now, did he intend to kill his girlfriend who was strangled to death during this trip? Um, no, because he intended to kill snakes. So you have to intend to kill a, a human being for murder. So because he intended to kill snakes, he, he made a mistake. It wasn't a snakes, it was a person. He made that mistake because he was on drugs. He didn't have the specific intent for murder. He didn't intend to kill or seriously harm a human being. However, he was still reckless 
and was found guilty of unlawful act manslaughter because him taking drugs led to him committing that crime. So he was reckless getting into that state by taking the, the LSD. So therefore he's reckless that he might commit a crime while he's having a trip. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So um, again, the courts tend to take quite a hard line on this. If the person had the mens rea, but maybe they overreacted, then you're not going to be able to use that as a defence. So this is normally where we're looking at a situation where... Um, we're comparing your behavior to a reasonable person and you're saying well i i didn't really act like a reasonable person because i was drunk that's that's obviously not going to work so in hatton for example he, he'd gotten very drunk and then he'd argued self-defense and he'd misunderstood the situation because he was so drunk and he misunderstood how much force you can use remember it has to be reasonable and proportionate in self-defense and um, attacking someone with a sledgehammer would generally not be so he was unable to use that as a defence. So you can't turn around and say, well, oh, I, I I, thought that they were coming at me more than they were. It just wouldn't work. There is a specific exception, and it is a very, very, very specific exception, as we'll see, when it comes to um, being able to say, I was drunk, so I, I misunderstood. And that's Section 5 of the Criminal Damage Act 1971. <laughs> very specific. So this is where a person commits criminal damage. So they damage another person's property. And what they can do is they can argue that if they honestly believed the owner would have consented to the destruction, then that's a defence. Now, notice it's not reasonable belief. Um, we're not looking at what people would have thought. And that's why it's an exception. So if a person honestly believed they would have consent, even if they honestly believed that when drunk, then that will be a defence. So Jaggard versus Dickinson shows this. Um, a person was going to stay at a friend's house. They were trying to get into their friend's house. No lights were on, etc. So they were going to have nowhere to sleep. So they broke into um, the friend's house. They, they broke a window. And, and the friend backed up. They, they honestly believed that the friend would be okay with this rather than her freezing to death in the streets at night. So she honestly believed that she could damage that window. Now it turns out that because she was drunk, she made a mistake. It was the house next door. She'd gone to the wrong house. But she'd honestly believed that she would have had consent to break that window. So she was able to use that as a defense. So with the rules on intoxication, um, hopefully I've broke it down into some key questions for you to look out for when you're doing a scenario. The other key thing to just bear in mind is public policy that we, we can't send out a message that it's okay for you to get drunk and to take drugs and to commit crimes. So the courts have to take quite a strong deterrent message in most situations that you may not have specific intent, but you are probably reckless by getting yourself into that state in the first place. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Thanks for watching.